From London, we present Bel Traffio, adapted by Norman Ginsbury from the story by Henry James. Did you have a comfortable journey, Mr. Harvey? Yes, thank you, Mr. Ambient. Through the prettiest country imaginable. Yes, it is lovely. Ah, here's the trap. Climb in. Ah. It's only about ten minutes to the cottage. It was kind of you to ask me down. I felt quite uh, exhilarated when your letter arrived. I asked you earlier, if you'd written earlier. You've had your letter of introduction for a very long time. Why didn't you use it before? Oh, the, the pleasure of meeting you is going to be so great that I wish to feel it and, and savour it. And not to mix it with the satisfactions that are, well, uh, more usual. Ah. My visit to the author of Beltraffio was to be a trump card. Well, you met me now. We've had some minutes' conversation. Do you still think your visit is going to be a trump card? I have no doubt about it. Beltraffio was published three years ago. I've read it five times. And now, with my riper judgment, I admire it as much as ever. But despite that, you delayed sending me your letter of introduction. I uh, heard you were working on a new book. I am working on a new book. And yet I asked if I might call on you. <laughs> you see, sir, my impatience to meet you outmatched all my reasons for not meeting you. <laughs> I'm glad it did. A short respite will help my work. And a critic who can criticize will help it even more. Here we are. Jump out. <sighs> what a delightful place. Yes, isn't it? Uh, my wife must be somewhere about. Uh, let's go and look. Oh, yes, there she is over there in the garden. The boy's with her. Uh, your son? Yes, our only child. Dolcino, come and see your daddy. No, she won't let him come. Uh, we'd better join them. Uh, uh, come along, they're, they're having tea. Oh, my dear, this is Mr. Harvey. Oh, how do you do? do? Mrs. Tabor, our vicaress. Uh, how do you do? How do, you do? <laughs> this is Dolcino. How do you do, sir? I'm very well, Dolcino, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, too, thank you, sir. How are your chrysanthemums, Mrs. Tibor? Oh, very healthy. I've been pinching them out. That's right. But don't go on after the end of this month. Oh, I never do. As a matter of fact, I shall probably finish this evening. I was just telling Mrs. Ambient I must leave, or I'll never, never, never finish my pinching. <laughs> Wasn't I, Mrs. Ambient? You were, Mrs. Tabor. I was also saying how impossible it was to tear myself away from your fascinating Dolcino. <laughs> Well, but there you are. Tear myself away, I must. Goodbye, dear Mrs. Ambient. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr... Uh, Harvey. Uh, Harvey. <laughs> Goodbye, ma'am. And good luck with your pinching. I'll walk to the gate with you, Mrs. Tabor. Uh, come with us, Dolcino. No, stay with us, darling. Can't I go with Papa? Not when I asked you to stay with me. Come along now. Papa, Mama wants me not to go with you. But he's very tired. He's been running about all day. He ought to be quiet till he goes to bed. Otherwise, he won't sleep. He's a precocious little pet. Well, you ought to be quiet now, just oh, the same. Oh, well, let him choose. Uh, will you go with me, Dolcino, or will you stay with your mother? Oh, it's a shame. I don't think I can choose. But I've been a great deal with Mama today. And very little with Papa. My dear fellow, I think you have chosen. Hmm? Come along. There, the three of us will go to the gate together. Soon be back, Mama. Well, that gives me a chance to talk to my guest, anyway. I can't tell you the pleasure to me of finding myself here. I have the greatest admiration for your husband. He'll like that. He likes being admired. He must have a very happy life, then. He has very many worshippers. Oh, yes. Uh, I've seen some of them. For me, he's quite the greatest of living writers. I can't judge. I know he's very clever. Oh, he's nothing less than superb, Mrs. Ambient. To see him in this familiar way, and to find the man as delightful as the artist, I assure you that to me, this is a red-letter day. We're very much afraid about the fruit this year. Uh, doesn't it promise well? No, it doesn't promise anything. The trees look very dull. We had such late frosts. Is Mr. Ambient fond of gardening? He's very fond of plums. I hope your crop will be better than you fear. <laughs> Oh, it's a lovely old place you live in. The whole impression is that of some of the places he's described in his books. Your house is like one of his pictures. Yeah, it's a pleasant little place, but there are hundreds like it. Oh, it has his tone, Mrs. Ambient. His tone? Surely he has a tone, Mrs. Ambient. Oh, yes, he has indeed. But I don't consider that I'm living in one of his books. Not in the least. Um, can you tell me when we might expect the appearance of the book he's working on now? I'm afraid you... 
You think I know much more about my husband's work than I do. You see, Mr. Harvey, I, I don't read what he writes. <laughs> He's coming back now, so you may ask him about the new book yourself. But don't you admire his writings, Mrs. Ambient? Don't you admire Beltraffio? Admire them? <laughs> oh, of course, he's, he's very clever. Come along, Del Tito. The vicaress has returned to her vicar. <laughs> it's a pity the vicar doesn't call more often. I think so, too. Hasn't Gwendolyn arrived yet? Oh, if she has, I haven't been told. Gwendolyn is my assistant, Mr. Harvey. Ah. Come, don't you know, it's your bedtime. Oh, not yet, Mama. Yes, darling, you must. Oh, can't I stay up just a little longer? No, no, not tonight. <laughs> Come with me, darling. Go with your mother, don't you know? Come along. Oh, dear. Good night, Papa. Good night, my boy. Mm -hmm. Sleep well. Good night, Mr. Harvey. Good night, Dolcino. Ah, that's an extraordinary boy of yours, Mr. Ambient. Mm -hmm. I've never seen such a child. Why do you call him extraordinary? Oh, he's so beautiful, so fascinating. Like some perfect little work of art. Oh, don't call him that, or you'll, you'll make his little future very difficult. I wouldn't for the world take any liberties with his little future. I should only be highly interested in watching it. You Americans notice more things than we do. As for my small son, we should probably kill him between us before we've done with him. And you mean by spoiling him? No, by fighting over him. Oh. Now, do you know, my wife asked me more than once whether I should like Dolcino to read Beltraffio. I told her I hoped he'd read all my books before he was 20. Then she asked me if I proposed to hide them or lock them up in a drawer until he was the right age. Yes. I said we must tell him they're not intended for small boys, and she replied that it was going to be very awkward when he was about 15. The difference between my wife and me is simply the opposition between two distinct ways of looking at the world which have never succeeded in getting on together. My wife will tell you that it's the difference between Christian and pagan. It's really the difference between making the most of life and making the least of it, so that you'll get another better life in some other time and place. Perhaps I care too much for beauty. I delight in it. Don't you think my wife is beautiful? I think she's quite beautiful. When we married, I wasn't aware of the differences I mentioned. I thought it all came to the same thing in the end. Perhaps it will, but I don't know what the end will be. Moreover, I care for seeing things as they are. But you mustn't talk to my wife about things as they are. She has a moral dread about things as they are. I suppose she's afraid for Dolce. Ah, uh, nothing shall ever hurt him. Nothing. <laughs> You're both agreed about that, anyway. Oh, of course. In our different ways. My wife thinks me immoral. That's the long and short of it. Very strange, isn't it? She's a very nice, remarkably well-behaved woman, and yet... She's, she's quite an angel of propriety. Yes, that's it, propriety. When I married her, I simply took her for an angel, but I never asked myself for what. Now you've told me, propriety. <laughs> yes, but her conception of life is so false that it makes me blush. And what's more... Oh, look, there's a light in Gwendolyn's room. That means she's arrived. Your sister? Yes, she comes and stays with us twice a year for a month. Uh, I hope you'll like her. Uh, uh, why shouldn't I? No reason at all. My wife doesn't, but as she's a person of conscience, she puts her best face on it. Or oh, they're very different. The usual feminine hypocrisies on either side cost them much more than the usual effort. Oh, but they manage. Now, perhaps we'd better go and uh, change for dinner. All alone? Yes. Uh, Mr. Harvey and I have come to join the ladies. Where's Beatrice? With Dolcino. The nurse called her to see him a quarter of an hour ago. Oh, why? Well, he seemed a little feverish. He was perfectly all right this afternoon. Beatrice says you walked him about too much. She says you almost killed him. Beatrice must be very happy. She has an opportunity to triumph. Uh, surely not if the child's ill. My dear fellow, you aren't married. You don't know the nature of wives? Uh, possibly not, but uh, I know the nature of mothers. Beatrice is perfect as a mother. I'm going out to see him. Beatrice won't let you see him, dear. Do you call that being perfect as a mother? From her point of view, yes. Oh, damn her point of view. I'm going up. It's all so very odd. But we are odd, aren't we, Mr. Harvey? It hadn't occurred to me, Miss Ambient. Don't you find us odd? Have you people like us in America? Oh, we've no one like your brother. I may go as far as that. You're probably more persons like his wife. I can tell you that better when you've told me about what you've just called her point of view. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, she doesn't like Mark's ideas. She doesn't like them for the child. What has that little fellow to do with ideas? Oh, surely he can't tell one from the other. Has he read his father's novels? Well, he's very precocious and very sensitive. And his mother thinks she can't begin to guard him too early. When one has children... 
Uh, what one writes becomes a great responsibility. Children are terrible critics. I'm really glad I haven't any. Do you also write, then? In the same style as my brother? Oh, I wish I could. Well, Mark, did you see him? No. She won't let me in. She's locked the door. I'm afraid to make a noise. If he were very bad, she'd have let you in. She tells me from behind the door that she'll let me know if he's any worse. That's very good of her. I'm going to wait up. No, don't stay, Gwendolen. Somebody must get some sleep. If you prefer it, Mark. But if you shouldn't need me... If I you... need you, you may be sure I'll call you. Good night, then. Good night, Good night. Good night. There can't be much the matter with the boy. Children frequently run high temperatures. It's much less serious with them than with an adult. Mm, yes, all the same, I think. What was that? I didn't hear anything. It's Beatrice, moving about in the boy's nursery. I'm sure she'll be down in a moment. I'll stay here till she is. Yes, she's still there. Yes, I can hear her now. Some critics have regretted that in my books, having gone so far, I haven't gone further. Oh, I'm not one of them. In my opinion, you've arrived at what I call a noble rarity. No one can go further than that. Perhaps not. Now, I want to be truer than I've ever been before. I want to give the impression of life itself. When I see the kind of things that life, the brazen hussy, does, I despair of ever catching up with her peculiar tricks. You have to observe her minutely for a lifetime before you know what she's up to. And then, when you write the truth, the bon gens roll up their eyes at what they regard as your cynicism. But, of course, we mustn't worry about the bon gens. And by bon gens, you mean the, the vicar and those who think like him? Exactly. We met for the first time a few hours ago, but I, I feel that we understand each other. Thank you for saying that. It makes me very proud. Well, I mean it. Oh, look, here are some sheets of my forthcoming book. Oh. Uh, these are just the early pages, of course. Uh, take them to your room and look them over at your pleasure. Oh, Mr. Ambient, I'm so flattered. Take them. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll take them to my room and read them at once. Mark. Beatrice. Well, how is he? I knew you'd be waiting up. Uh, Dolce knows much quieter. He'll probably be... Quite better in the morning. Ah, uh, I'll go and see for myself. No, no, you, you wake him. Oh. Oh, I, I wish he'd take my word for it. He's certain to wake, don't you know? I'm sure he'll be as quiet as possible. Why don't you go to bed, Mr. Harvey? It's well past midnight. Uh, Mr. Ambient was waiting up, so I stayed to talk to him. Mm. I, I'm going now, and I'm taking these proof sheets with me. And they're the opening chapters of his new book. Indeed? I don't take that sort of interest in my husband's proof sheets. I consider his writings most objectionable. Good night. Good night. Good morning, Miss Ambient. Good morning, Mr. Harvey. Oh, it's lovely here in the garden, isn't it? Quite lovely. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. How about you? I usually sleep well, but last night I was worried about Dolcino. How is he today? I hope he's better. I think he is. We might expect to see him later. You must explain something to me, Miss Ambient, because I'm very puzzled. You must know that, to me, your brother is a very great writer, the greatest I have read among living authors. If there is one person in the world who might have been expected to agree with me, it's his wife. And yet last night she told me she considered her husband's writings most objectionable. They were her very words, most objectionable. Now tell me, was she trying to startle me? Or is it the sorry truth that she resents his novels? It's the sorry truth, I'm afraid. But she usually doesn't come out with it so soon. Oh, poor woman. She must have seen I'm a fanatic. Oh, she won't like you for that. Won't like me? She must have found me insufferable. I laid it on with a trowel. You mustn't mind as long as the rest of us like you. Beatrice is really a charming woman. A very strange woman. Maybe, maybe. Beatrice and Mark, unfortunately, are mismated, but they have no differences except this one. Beatrice thinks Mark's writings immoral and his influence pernicious, and she's afraid for the child. She seems to be trying the whole time to, to keep him away from his father. If she could, she'd prevent Mark from even so much as touching him. Everyone knows it. Visitors see it for themselves, so there's no harm in my telling you. Isn't it excessively odd? It is, certainly. But why does she think like that? Why? Because she's so religious and so tremendously moral. But then some of Mark's ideas are, well, really rather impossible, don't you think? 
No, I must say I don't. Do you think art is everything? In art, of course I do. But surely with reservations. One must be good, mustn't one? If one must be good, why don't you go to church? On Sunday morning, supreme virtue for me consists in answering the week's letters. By the way, Mr. Harvey, it's not true about Dolcino being better. His mother says he is, but I've seen him, and he's not at all right. But surely his mother would know, wouldn't she? Not necessarily. There are strange elements at work. Strange elements? Do you mean in the constitution of the child? No. I mean in my sister-in-law's feelings. Elements of affection and elements of anxiety. But that's quite natural. Why do you call them strange? Well, undoubtedly there are elements of affection and elements of anxiety, but Beatrice is much more than anxious. You seem very perturbed, Miss Ambient. But his father will have seen Dolcino by now. If he's not satisfied, he'll send for the doctor. Dr. McIntosh ought to have been called already. He lives only a couple of hundred yards away. Ah, your brother is coming now. Oh, Dolcino's on his back. Will you talk to him about the calling the doctor? I did, just before I came out. He wanted to talk to Beatrice first. She's just behind them. Ah, good morning. Ah. Oh, morning, Harvey. <laughs> well, here we are with our temporary invalid. Oh, do put him down, Mark. He's not a bit of disease. Would you like to stand on your feet, my boy? Yes, I would. I'm feeling very well now. Oh, well, down you come. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Happy enough? Yes, I am. And now that you're all here, I think I'll go and write my letters. I was keeping Mr. Harvey company till you arrived. See you later. Beatrice, I'm going to walk over to Dr. McIntosh. I don't like bothering him on Sunday, but I think he ought to see Dolcino. That's Gwendolyn's idea, I suppose. It's not such an out-of-the-way idea. The boy is ill. But I'm not ill, Papa. I'm much better. Well, why don't you hop about if you feel so lusty? Because Mama's holding me close. Oh, yes. I know how Mama holds you when I am nearby. You can go for Dr. McIntosh if you like, Mark. Perhaps it would be better. You ought to drive. Ah, she says that to get me out of the way. <laughs> All right, then. I'm off for Dr. McIntosh. Uh, you slept well, Mr. Harvey? Yes, thank you, I did. Uh, I was a little concerned about Dolcino and, and also about something you said to me last night. Oh, what was that? I couldn't get over your description of your husband's work as objectionable. It seems such an immense pity that, that so much interesting writing should be lost on you. Nothing's lost on me, Mr. Harvey. I know he's interesting to many people. Don't you like Papa's books, Mama? No, no, darling, don't interrupt. Won't you read them to me, Mr. Harvey? Oh, uh, well, um, I, I'd rather tell you some stories of my own. I know that some that are awfully good. Oh, when will you tell them to me? Tomorrow? Uh, yes, tomorrow, with pleasure, if that suits you. Well, you're staying tonight, then. Uh, Mr. Ambient asked me to, and I said I'd like to. I hope it won't inconvenience oh, you. Oh, no, no, not at all. When I left you last night, I went to bed with your husband's proof sheets. Yes, I know. We discussed them. I was entranced. I was reading them till three o'clock in the morning. You're certainly an enthusiast. I read them over twice. You say you haven't looked at them. I think it's a pity, a great pity. Let me beg you to take them and read them uh, when you have time. I'm sure they'll convert you. I know he's worked very hard over the new book, but... Uh... Well, uh, I must take Dolcino to the nursery now. The doctor will be here soon. Oh, let me carry him. No, no, he's not heavy. Uh, oh, have you still got the proof sheets of the new book? I put them back in Mr. Ambien's study. Oh, I see. Well, I thought I, I might take your advice. I'm delighted, Mrs. Ambient. It's a wise decision. I'll pick them up on my way. Oh, now we must hurry, Dolcino. The doctor will be here in a minute. Yes, Mama. They're on his desk. Thank you. Oh, hello, Harvey. Oh, you brought the doctor? Yes, he's just gone up to the nursery. I'll be seeing him uh, before he goes. I have some news for you. Yes? What is it? Your wife wants to read those proof sheets. No. It's true. Huh. What has suddenly made her so curious? <laughs> well, I'm afraid I'm at the bottom of the mystery. Ah. It's been on my conscience that she, of all people, was unable to appreciate the worth of her husband's writings. So I implored her to read the opening chapters of the new book. And she agreed. Well, I'll be... We'll wait and see exactly what value she puts on them. <laughs> She'll probably burn them up, emendations and all. <laughs> and I've got no copy.
Sir? Well, what is it? Uh, Dr. McIntosh. That's my name. I won't keep you a moment. I'm a friend of the family. Uh, may I know how Dolcino is this morning? Well, I called to see him, and I'm afraid I haven't. You haven't seen him? Uh, no, Mrs. Ambient met me at the door, told me he was sleeping soundly, didn't want him disturbed. She said he was much better, and that from now on she'd look after him as so. well. But last night? At ten o'clock last night when I called, the boy's condition was serious. But you'll be coming back to see him, surely? Oh, no, sir. I'll be hanged if I'll come back. Yep. Well, I'm damned. What's come over the woman? Good morning, Mr. Harvey. Oh, good morning, Miss Ambient. Uh, aren't you coming out into the garden? Uh, not for a moment or two. Breakfast won't be ready for a little while. I'm waiting to see the doctor. The doctor's gone. What? Was that the doctor who drove off just now? Yes. Did you say that was Dr. McIntosh? Yes. He didn't see the boy. Why not? Mrs. Ambien wouldn't let him. She told him that Dolcina was much better and that she'd look after him herself from now on. She must be off her head. Dolcina's dangerously ill. Yesterday what? evening there was a sudden change for the worse. When the doctor came at ten o'clock, he said there were symptoms of diphtheria. Diphtheria? Yes. Mark didn't go to bed till Dolcino had quietened down. I sat up very late, then went to the boy's room. The nurse let me in. Mrs. Ambient was sitting by the bed. She held Dolcino's hand in one of hers, and in the other... What do you think? The opening chapters of Mark's new book. She was reading them intently. Did you ever hear anything so strange? What a very odd time to be reading. What a very odd time to be reading an author she never could abide. What happened when you went in? She looked up at me and put her finger on her lips. The nurse was about to go to bed, so I offered to stay up with the boy while Mrs. Ambient snatched a few moments' sleep. She refused. How was Dolcino then? He looked flushed and unnatural. And his breathing was laboured. What change could have taken place in him between then and now to justify Mrs. Ambient refusing to let Dr. McIntosh see him? But what a time to be reading Mr. Ambient's new book. Oh, you better go into breakfast. Mark will be down by now. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Gwendolyn. Morning, Harvey. Good morning. You're both having coffee, aren't you? Yeah, please. Not for me. Will you have tea? No, nothing for me. I, I, I can't eat anything. What is it, Mark? In heaven's name, what's got possession of Beatrice? My poor Mark. Beatrice is always Beatrice. She's locked herself in with that boy, bolted and barred the door. She refuses to let me go near him. She refused to let Dr. McIntosh see him an hour ago. Refused to let McIntosh see him? By God, I'll smash the door in. Uh, Miss Ambient, uh, why don't you go up and, and see if you can reason with her? I, I think I will. I must. Try to see your wife's point of view, Mr. Ambient. Uh, women have an instinct for these matters. She's the boy's mother, and, and she's doing what she feels is yes, best. Yes, yes, I know all that. But she can't take the place of a doctor. I argued with her through that closed door for 20 minutes. If you won't let me in, then for God's sake, let the doctor see him. How dared she send him away? Mark! Mark, go for the doctor. Go this moment. What? Huh? Is he dying? I don't know, but Beatrice is frightened out of her wits now, and she wants the doctor. He told me he'd be hanged if he came back. That's why Mark must go himself. A messenger would be no good. You must see him, Mark. You must tell him it's to save Dolcino. I'm going. And I'll save him, please, God. Shouldn't I have gone instead? No, Mark had to go. I had to get him away, to get him away, while I think. While I think. While you think of what? The uns thing that has happened under this roof. Is the boy dying? Tell me. It's too late to save him. She's let him die. No, no. Don't say that. I say she's let him die. You had the idea of making her read Mark's new book, hadn't you? I've already told you that. I told her she ought to read it. But what has that to do with it? I don't understand you. Yes, you do. You understand me perfectly. Your accusations, monstrous. I say it all. I'm not stupid. It was a book that finished her. The book that decided her. Decided? Are you suggesting that she's murdered her own child? I'm suggesting that she sacrificed him. She made up her mind to do nothing to save him. And why else did she lock herself in? Why else did she turn away the doctor? It was Mark's book that did it. It horrified her. She was convinced it would contaminate her son, so she determined to rescue him, to prevent him from ever being defiled by his father's ideas. Miss Ambient! Dolcino had a crisis at two o'clock in the morning, the nurse told me. Beatrice had called her back. 
The poor child got much worse, but she sent the nurse back to bed again and stayed alone with the boy for the rest of the night. Are you telling me that, that she's insane or that she's pitiless? The nurse told me his mother was holding Dolcino in her arms, but she gave him no remedies. Everything the doctor left is untouched. She's had the honesty not even to throw the drugs away. Miss Ambient, do you know what you're saying? You know I'm telling you the truth. Within the last half hour, she's had a revulsion. She's terrified now at what she's done. She'd give heaven and earth now to save the poor child. Perhaps it's not too late. Perhaps. Uh, shouldn't you stay with her in the nursery? At least till your brother gets back? You better go and judge. She's like a wounded tigress. You've said some harsh things, Miss Ambient. What you've said to me, I can forget readily. But, but you must promise me that you will never tell your brother what you've just told me. What was that? I, I don't know. Dr. McIntosh, what has happened? It's too late. The boy is... He's gone? Yes. If you take my advice, he'll arrange for your sister-in-law to have a long holiday. Oh. Oh, she'll have a serious breakdown. I won't vouch for her sanity. A mark? He's frantic about the boy, but he realises that his chief concern now must be for his wife. Yes, of course. His wife. He considers the tragedy is the result of her extravagant devotion to her son. Her extravagant devotion to her son. If that's what Mr. Ambient thinks. That's what I think, too. Poor little Dolcino. Poor Mark. And poor, poor Beatrice. <laughs> that was Beltraffio by Henry James adapted as a play for radio by Norman Ginsbury. The part of Mark Ambient was played by James McKechnie, Beatrice Ambient by Griselda Harvey, Gwendolyn Ambient by Janet Burnell, and Nicholas Harvey by Ronald Wilson. From London we present Don't Wait For Me, a play for radio by David Campton. Sit at the table by the window, madam. I'll have a cup of coffee. If you wouldn't mind moving. Strong, black and without froth. I'll be glad to serve you at another table. Mm, you wouldn't be glad to serve me anywhere. I saw your face when I waltzed in. Drop like an old sack. You make your customers proper welcome, don't you? We cater for a high-class trade. Select people come for coffee in here. I know what's wrong with you. You don't want anybody to peep through the window and see me picking my nose. It might put them off. You know how long it is since I had a wash? <laughs> Neither do I. I'll bet I stink. Where's that coffee? This table. You know what I've just come from? The police court. You know what the beak did? He fined me for being drunk and disorderly. You again. That was his first words. You again, he says. Logging's too good for you, you drunken old baggage. Perhaps they weren't his exact words, but that's what he meant. So he finds me. You know what for? Aiming a pint pot at this barman. I missed him, though. Pity. You know why I threw that jar, do you? He wouldn't serve me. Cup of coffee, please. Good morning, sir. Oh, good, uh, good morning. Table for one, sir. Uh, over in the corner. Well, I'll, um, I'll sit here, if you don't mind, by the uh, window. Well, that seat is... Well, could I, would you bring me a cup of coffee, please? Oh, some people. Liz. You can't sit here. This table's reserved. You didn't have to, you know. I, I mean, run away from me is as if... I'm not in the habit of talking to strange men. I thought I'd lost you. Th then I saw you through this window. A lady can't have a coffee without being accosted. <laughs> I don't know what this place is coming to. I was there. I heard... Um, they didn't give you half a chance. That magistrate didn't even listen. Is there a copper about? I've got a chap here making suggestions. I shut up shop this morning. I went straight round to the court as soon as I heard. I, I thought you might sort of need me. The fine, for instance. If you hadn't got enough for the fine, I might have locked you up. Have you done forcing your attentions on me? I'll go. If you really want me to. Oh, sit where you are, you wet lump of tribe. You admit that we know each other, then? Know each other? Well, if it isn't, Eddie... Old Eddie Jones. So is he the devil any day than your gormless mug? Two copies. Oh, thanks. Pass the sugar. Well, were you satisfied? What with? The show. I saw you in the public gallery along with all the other old perishers. It's warm, dry and free. The first time for you, wasn't it? You've missed all my other performances. 
I hope you enjoyed yourself. It was awful, stuck up there, not being able to do anything to help. Help? Oh. That's why I followed you. I want... You can't go on like this. Who says? I want to do something for you. I mean, if only for old time's sake. It's daft, us both living in the same town and never... It's not as if we'd ever quarrel up. Look, I want to help. Don't stare like that, your eyes will drop out. What's the matter with me? Tide marks showing? You haven't changed, Liz, not really. You haven't changed a bit. You're still the girl... No, I'm not. The girl you knew has been smothered under 15 stone of fat. You don't recognise that. You're softer than I took you for. I'll drink your coffee and get out. Do you know what this place is? Do you? Don't you try and make me sorry for myself. I've deserved all I've got. This is the place where I first met you. Oh, don't be gormless. This cafe hasn't been built more than a couple of years. Oh, it was open ground then, but the town had hardly pushed out this far. You must remember. You were trying to make my flesh creep. There was a, a bit of a brook. It ran just about where those tables are now. They must have, uh, what do you call it, you know, pushed it out of the way, diverted it. And there were trees. Shut up, will you? You're worse than hangover. Shut up! It was a Sunday afternoon. What was? When I met you. I knew you'd be off like this. I kept out of your way while I could. Not long after the Great War, it'd be. Not more than a few years, anyway. About 1920. Slobber, slobber, slobber. You wouldn't have been more than 16 with funny long skirts in your hair flying wild. If you don't give over, I'll let you have this coffee straight between the eyes. I was only trying to remind you. You're making me sick. Counting cherry stones. Picking daisy petals. Well, you needn't trouble yourself. I can give you the answer now. It's she loves me not. Forty years ago. Here, right here on the common. It don't do any good to remember. There was a girl with you. What was her name? Oh, leave me out of it. Liz! Elizabeth! I'm calling you! Hello, can I... Oh, uh, Can I do anything for you? No. No, you can't. I, I didn't frighten you, did, did I? I heard you calling. I wasn't calling for you. I, I know, but I thought I... I'm sorry. I don't talk to strange boys. Elizabeth! I didn't mean to... Elizabeth! Elizabeth! Please! Oh, Elizabeth! Boo! Oh, <laughs> too. I was watching you from behind John tree. I don't talk to strange boys. <laughs> she tries to make sure oh, that I don't either. That's why I dodged her. Are you Elizabeth? I have my eye on you. You were sitting reading behind that bush. Yes. What's your name? Eddie. Eddie George. What do you do? Work in the shoe shop. Have you ever been out with a girl? No. Sooner sit reading? No. Bet you think I've got a cheek. All them questions. No. I, I think... I, I think... What? Well, you're pretty. Think so? Well, nice hair. And and you've got bl bl blue eyes. I wish you didn't sound so daft when you said that. I, I meant it. Did you? You're not so bad looking yourself. Pity you're so slow. Well, I, I can't help that, I suppose. Do you want to know something? I've never talked to a strange lad before. I did it for a dare. Our oh, ma'am says I mustn't talk to strange lads. She says you never know what might happen. Nothing happened, though, did it? Yes. Well, what happened? Well, I, I can't say, but something happened but to me. You might look muckstruck, but you're nice. Oh. I think we could get on together. It's a pity I only started talking to make Vine mad. Liz! Liz! Elizabeth! I'm going to make her madder. It's not fair, making me run after you. Your mother wouldn't like it if she... Oh. We'd better be going. You're not scared, are you? Not of him. He tried to get... He spoke to me. Well, I spoke to him, so that makes us evens. Your mother's going to hear all about this. Oh, is she? She'll want to know what you were doing while it was going on. That's not fair. He's going to take me out next Sunday, aren't you? If you want me to. Let's see. We could bust it out as far as the locks. Then he could take me on the river. Oh, I, I don't know where the... Oh, yes. I'll manage it somehow. In a canoe or a punt. I've never been in a punt before. Nor have I. This is the last time I ever come out with you, Elizabeth Wharton. He's got muscles up his arms. He come and feel his muscles, Vi. No. Muscles. I bet you're a devil with a punt ball. You swore. First it's boys, then it's bad language. I'm going straight home. When your mother sees me all alone, she's going to ask questions. The way you're going on, you'll never know the answers. You're only jealous. Give her a kiss too, Eddie. Oh, no. Go on. I warned you. Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble. For our ma'am. She might give me the strap, that's all. She's very handy with the strap, is our ma'am. Perhaps I... 
Should I go on with you and explain? You! She'd slaughter you. I'm not old enough to go out with boys. I'm not 16 till next August. Oh, then you... Oh. What? Well, you won't be coming out next Sunday. Did you think I was serious? About going on river? I thought you were just playing up with me. It was only meant to be a joke. I didn't know you'd take it serious. Oh, no, of course you didn't. Would you really have taken me on the bus? I I'd do anything you asked. Would you? Why? Well, because you're you, I suppose. You don't mean it. I, I do. You mean, if I asked you to, to jump in that brook, you'd go right ahead. As long as it was you that asked. You'd get wet. I'd do it. All right, then. Go and jump in that brook. Go on. I'm asking you. All right. All right, I will. Stop! Hey, stop! I asked you to stop. You wouldn't have can you beat that. Come back here. Come on, please. Do you believe me now? Yes. I wonder if you'd have stopped, though, when you got to the edge. Do you want to try me? No. You've only got to ask. Do you really want to take me out? If you'll come. I'll come. You know, I think I'm going to like you. You might easily be something special. Anything you said. You'd do anything. <laughs> Ruddy fools of fair lovers. <laughs> Is that the memory you took to bed with you on cold winter's nights? Where you read me to ruin? I, I didn't. We never did anything. You showed me how I twiddle a man around my finger. At fifteen and a bit. Talk about games with loaded guns. I never believed such a thing could happen. Not to me. Oh, slosh. Turns me over inside to think. Oh, blast you for making me remember. To hell with you. May you rot where it's hot is. Damn. Damn. Liz. What? Will you marry me? Nutcase. I've not much to offer, never had. Anybody got a spare straight jacket? Just that cobbler's shop with a bit of a flat on top. Mm, the cuckoos are out late this year. But it's yours, such as it is, it, if you want it. Not myself this morning. If I were, I'd land you a smack where it matters, you and your suggestions. Do you remember how we... I told you what you could do with your memories. We could get on together. There's never been anybody else, never. I've heard it all before. It was here where I asked you the first time. Here. Oh, wait while well, I stick my fingers in my ears. I thought it was appropriate, the place where we met. How did they switch you off? With the Mayfair in full blast. Now or never, I thought. At the back of the roundabout. Look, what right have you... May 1925. Oh, what's past this past? Very it. I'd already waited four years. You were 19 and looked a picture. No. 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 You've sort of grown up in the last couple of years. I'm a big girl now. Taken to knocking about with all sorts of fellas. There's more than one sort of fella in this town. What one hasn't got, another has. I don't want to miss anything, that's all. <laughs> you can't have missed much. Are you complaining? No, I I've just noticed. You didn't drag me into the shadows just to tell me that, did you? I, I meant to say that, that sooner or later... You'll have to give up going round with so many fellas and, and settle down with one. And you've made up your mind who the one ought to be? Yes. Is this it? A proposal? Well, you, you could call it that. Oh. Well? I often wondered how, how it might happen. <laughs> Never thought of back of the caravans behind the roundabouts. Are we going to see the Wall of Death? They say a fella got killed there a couple of years back. Will you? There's something about you, something any girl ought to jump at. You're kind and thoughtful. You might only be a cobbler, but you're a real gentleman. The girl who marries you won't have a thing to worry about. You will, then? No, Eddie. Oh. Did you expect me to say yes? But that was the idea. I've been saving. You haven't bought a ring, have you? Not yet. That's a blessing. Though I suppose it might have done for your next girl. There won't be a next girl. There couldn't be anybody else after knowing you. I'm not all that special. You're worth ten of me, Eddie. Then what? Don't go asking for reasons. It's too early, that's why. I'm 19. That's no age to be getting tied. You know what marriage means as well as I do. Sweating over a boiling stove with hands red raw from the washing water. Having kids. 
And end him with a figure like a sweet pudding. Liz, it needn't be like Don't that. Don't contradict me. I've seen me, ma'am. All right. Happen I'll come to it sooner or later. But it's too soon yet. I'm not ready to be locked in the kitchen. I've got to know what's round the corner. Don't want to hurt you. I'm not sure what love is. I can guess how a daughter feel, though. And I come closer to that with you than with anybody else. I'm a fool to say no, but... Then don't say it. Just say, not yet. That's hardly fair on you now, is it? I'll wait. I wouldn't advise it. Oh, you're worth waiting for. I might go off in the end with a bloke in a big car. I've seen Arthur Kirby looking at me. He's got money to swim in. I might say yes tomorrow to a fur coat and house up the lane. I'll take a risk. You're making it too easy for me. If only you... Oh, go on. Oh, but Liz... Don't maul me. Sorry, I'm... Go away. Oh, if that's what you want. Leave me alone. Leave me. Look, what I ask if I didn't want? Leave me. Leave me. Leave me. Oh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. But you see, I did wait. What for? Everybody else is leaving. I wanted to take care of you, Liz. I still do. W won't you let me? You can't go on like this, booze all night and magistrates in the morning. I can't watch you sink. Well, nobody forces you. Where's the next meal coming from? Where's the next drink coming from? That's more to the point. I feel like lending me a couple of quid. I left a lump of shin beef in the pot with onions and a bit of melt. I'll make dumplings when I get home. A plate of stew would do you good. I've been tempted with a fur coat before now, but never a plate of stew. And there's a comfy bed for you. Ah, didn't take you long to get round to that, did it? Well aired with clean sheets and a new quilt. Any time you want it. And the bedroom's been fresh papered. I did it myself last spring. It's better than sleeping rough, isn't it? How do you know? You've been keeping your eyes open. The nights are getting colder. Liz, how do you think it's going to end? With a funeral at the taxpayer's expense. You still trailing after me, I suppose? A bunch of snowdrops in your hot little hand. Wouldn't it be better for both of us if you were to marry me instead? It's not me you'll be mourning, though. It'll be that sharp-eyed little puss with the shining hair and the 18-inch waist. Might save yourself the trouble, though. You said goodbye to her long enough since. I never would. I knew that come a time when you wouldn't turn me down. You had everything worked out. I was bound to end neck deep in the muck. And there would be Eddie on his famous white horse to pull me clear. I had everything worked out as well. We were both wrong. <laughs> they started to cook dinner. I, I can smell the chips. Would you like a meal here? I I'll get it for you. We, we can have the stew tomorrow. Chips? This place was a chip shop before it was bombed out. They built it on the old recce, not far from the brook where the fair used to pitch. <laughs> this place used to be a chip shop. You're not the only one that can remember. Only I try to stop myself. Who wants to remember? Chip pans were over there. Chromium, weren't they, with mirrors over the top? Chips. There's nothing like the smell for bringing back old times. Why'd you let me go on? It was high class fish shop. Used white butcher's paper for wrapping instead of old newspapers. Hygienic, but not so interesting. I don't want to remember. There was a certificate for something or other on the wall and a big plate glass window and that old woman who talked to herself. Do separate penniless, she said. You get more if you ask for separate penniless, more than two penniless anyway. Who was she? Ma Parsons, old Ma Parsons, died years ago. They warm you. Yeah. They give your belly a lining. You've got to see your belly to a line. We always said she lived in a dog kennel. She was found one morning, frozen stiff. Look after the inner man, I say. Let the outer man look after himself. And you were there too. Blast you, you were always there. Hello, Liz. Why, Eddie? Still waiting? I thought you might have given up. I don't see enough of you these days to, to miss a single chance. I've got something to... That you ought to know. You don't know what it's like when you're young. Had we better go, go outside? She doesn't matter. She's not all here. <laughs> they make good chips, though. And nobody else is likely to come near while she's feeding. Let's move round a bit, then the wind will be blowing the other way. I eat them slow to make them last. Ooh, they've gone. What, what was it you, you wanted to tell me? We've known each other a long time now. Over ten years. 
Long enough to talk straight out with, without beating about the bush. Aye. I was 26 last birthday. It's time I was thinking about my old age pension. Liz, have you changed your mind uh, about us? No. I'm one of their best customers, and they know it. I've had an offer. You've met Arthur, haven't you? Arthur Kirby. You must have done. Drives all over the place in a big red sports car. Oh, I, I might have seen the car. Runs that garage on the top of the hill. It's his own, you know. He put all his savings into it, and now he's making money so fast he doesn't know what to do with it all. And he wants to spend some on me. The red sports job isn't his only car, you know. He's got two others. And a house of his own. He's having a tennis court built. Well, it's him. He's asked me. He wants to marry you? Not exactly. He's married already. Well, if that's what you want... You'll do more for me than any other man in this town. <sighs> How many do you know with a tennis court in their backyard? There isn't room to bounce a ball in ours or yours. And he's got three cars. He's going to teach me how to drive. Sharky lot. I wouldn't give a my custom if they make good chips. He's <laughs> proper gone on me. He'd marry me like a shot if it wasn't for his wife. Congratulations. I'm never likely to do any better. Three cars and a tennis court. I hope you'll be happy. Who else do you know with three cars and a tennis court? He always wanted to get on. He's no more than ten years older than me anyway. I'll never be able to afford even one car. And parties every weekend. The amount of whiskey that goes into that house. He doesn't drink much, though. Only when his leg hurts him. He had it broke up in the war. His temper gets a bit short when his leg hurts him, but he's an angel when it doesn't. When he does any damage, he always apologises afterwards. Yeah. And the things he's promised me. You'd be surprised. If it's what you want. Oh, stop saying that. Of course, it's not what I want. I want a white wedding with bridesmaids and an organ and a ring on my third finger. But it's the best I'm likely to get. Three cars and a tennis court. You feel the weather when you get past seven. I'm 26. I'm making the most of what I'm blessed with. You're a young one. <laughs> what I wanted to tell you was... He's inclined to be jealous. He doesn't like the idea of other fellas trespassing. He's liable to it out. Well, after all, he's paying. You needn't be crude. No. I wouldn't want you to get mixed up in a fight over me, Eddie. There's not much chance of that. I can't imagine you defying anybody. I'm happy as long as you are. Well, that's both of us satisfied, isn't it? So you'll have to fade out, as it were. We shan't be seeing so much of each other in the future. I only want what's best for you. Hey, I wish I could afford a bobs with that stuff myself silly. It, nobody listens to me. It won't as well be long before myself. you get married yourself, Eddie. You've got a lot to offer a girl. None of it's what you want. You are to try window dressing. Promise the moon. Give her the crown jewels to look forward to. Bed and breakfast's all very well, but there's no romance in it. Wouldn't you like to coax me away from Arthur? He, he can't marry you. I'll still wait. The most tempting offer I've heard yet. <laughs> Let them come and go. I'll still be here when others have gone. You're going to marry me, Liz. You're going to marry me. Am I, Eddie? Yes, I, I can wait. Then you'll wait forever, you sloppy boob. And I'm warning you. Stay out of my road when I'm driving. Liz! Hey, hey, the last of me chips all gone. Yeah, that, that's the way it is, more's the pity. It don't last. Hey. Yeah, what? You want looking after. Oh, hey, 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 Get yourself something to eat. Oh. Liz! Liz. Yeah, yeah, but it is, it, it, it's half a crown. You, you made a mistake, young fella. <laughs> I could order all chips in the pan and eat and eat. Or I could hang on to it and have extra penance tomorrow. And the day after, it'll last longer in penance. <laughs> That's right, we'll make it last, 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 Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. Drink your coffee. Nothing lasts. I wouldn't say nothing. I should have had my fortune told. You know what it would have said? Never trust a one-legged man when there's a depression in the month. Especially if he owns a garage and a bank book full of overdraft. He put his head in the gas oven and me on the streets and that was that. Still, it was a beginning. There were plenty more after him. All shapes, sizes and colours. Not one named Eddie. I made a promise. Here I am. What am I supposed to do, cheer? You know better than any of the others. You still want what they wanted. You're prepared to pay a different price, that's all. They're just like the rest. There's, there's something something special about me. I'm not cracking myself up. It, it, it's just that I know the real Liz. 
I can remember what they can't. The girl who dared me to jump in the brook. Whatever happens, you'll always be that girl to me. Now, will you come home with me? Not if you were the last man in the world. Why? Live with you, you great insensitive lump. What have I done? Done? You've made me ashamed of myself. Me. I thought shame and me were strangers. I can face up to any chap, eye to eye, as blazing as they come. He can only see this, you see, this tousled mess. He can't tell what used to be. You, you have to remind me what might have been. The very sight of you makes me want to crawl into a hole and hide. And why, why? Because in your eyes there's still that fresh-faced cutie with the world at her feet. Live with you? I've got to live with myself. I'll have to go on the booze again tonight to take the taste of you out of my mind. They walked home hand in hand, you and the girl who dared you to jump in the brook. Do me a favour, will you? Next time, make it the canal and stay out of my sight, permanent. I want you, Liz. Not me. Not this bit of old filth. You wouldn't want this in your nice, clean home. It wouldn't go with the new wallpaper. You can't run away from me again. You know how you'll end, don't you? Like Ma Parsons. That's about it. All my life I've worked it for you. You had your chances, why didn't you take them? Chances? The first time you asked me to marry you. The night I told you about Arthur. You didn't want me. How do you know what I wanted? Y you wouldn't have said yes. Then why didn't you make me? Why didn't you grab out of... <sighs> anyway, it's too late now. It's too late now. Liz! Liz! I really can't do with all that shouting. Give the place a bad name. Has she gone? She's gone. Oh. Then you'll be paying for both. What? Oh. Oh, oh yes. I'd better pay for both of us. That was Don't Wait For Me by David Campton. The part of Liz was played by Violet Carson and Eddie by George A. Cooper. From London, we present The Demon King, adapted for radio from the story by J.B. Priestley. The Demon King. Hey, miss. Two more. Right. Well, what does thou think? I hope no need to be rude. Hey, yeah, I'm not here at the air to chaps with fancy ways. <laughs> not have you at the air to don't think it. And they're very nice fellas from Royal, I'd have you know. There's your pints. That'll be eight pence. Mm -hmm. Profit dearing. Uh, hey, Nelly, uh, mm -hmm. did you see much of the theatre chaps you were going on about? Oh, aye, they're coming all the time. It's handy for them, do you see, during rehearsals, like. They've only to walk across streets. Oh, fancy. <laughs> theatre chaps. Hey, uh, there's, uh, there's two of them at that corner table. Nay, oh, are they? <laughs> By God, wait while I tell her, Maggie, I've been supping with actors. Actors? <laughs> <laughs> That's the stage manager and his assistant, Mr. Rudd and Mr. Sampson, their names are. Uh, it's all right, they talking, Sammy. But there's nothing actually wrong with the company, Horace. Oh, no, only everything. I've been in this theatre 37 years, never struck such a feckless lot of folk. A jolly, friendly party, they call it in Buddhist Adult. Yes, well, that does seem yeah, rather... You see what it says? A jolly, friendly party of the company of players assembled by Mr Tom Burt for this year's grand annual pantomime at our Theatre Royal. In Jack and Jill, Buddhist will find a veritable feast of talent. For that accomplished young lady, Mr Brett, as Jack... <laughs> That's good. She'll not see 40 again. <laughs> and Miss Gertie Lavasseur as a charming Jill. By God, you should see him fight. Not to mention the uproariously amusing Dame Durden of Mr. Johnny Wingfield. <laughs> uproariously amusing. Oh, well, I wouldn't have put it that way myself, Then, certainly. of course, uh, says this daft reporter chap, we have that delightful Queen of Song, Miss Dulcie Farrer, appropriately cast as the Queen of Furryland, and Butterford's own favourite, Mr. Kirk Arton, in splendid form as the Demon King. <laughs> what about that, Sammy? Yes, I know. He's awful. Awful. Mind you, mind you, you've not seen him at his best. He used to be a great performer, did Kirk. Toured with the opera. Mephistopheles in Faust and all that sort of thing. Grand singer. And now, look at him. Tragic. Lift him the elbow, Sammy. That's what's brought Kirk Arton down. Oh, look out, he's coming in. Oh, aye. Evening, Kirk. Evening. Um, have a drink, won't you? Thanks. Beer? Brandy. Oh, I'll, I'll get it for you. 
Um, brandy, please, miss. Thank you. Uh, how much? Oh, dear, I'm afraid I've only... No, no, it's all right. I've got a sixpence. Here you are, Mr. Ryerton. Thanks. Health. <laughs> Same again, Nelly. I want two pints. Oh, thank you, but I don't think I want Go to. Go on, take it. Keep them in good humour. Oh, of course. Um, rehearsal all right for you today, Mr. Ryerton? Quite happy? Of course. Why not? What's worrying oh, you? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Thought you seemed a bit depressed, that's all. He'll go down well here. They're very musical in Brudersford. But you know it, of course. I do, and I loathe the place. Now, now, Kirk. Not wrong with Brudersford. Shall I tell you what I think about Brudersford, gentlemen? Well, not if it's... Brudersford is a rotten, beastly backwater of a place, and if there's a worse one in England, I hope I never play it. That's all. Oh, come, come now, Mr. Ayrton. I heard that, and it were right rude. We're not unkind to you, are we? No, no, no. Sorry, my dear. Not meant for you. Always nice to me. Uh, let me brandy. Uh, your beers, Mr. Sampson. Thank you very much, Nelly. Uh, uh, and I'll have another brandy. Ah, when well, you paid for that one... Aunt Beer. Oh, I say, th th there, my dear. You know, Sampson, you know, Rudd, what's the matter with me here in Brothersford? Not well. Not well at all. Cold. Always cold. Shivering like an aspen. Funny that for a demon king, eh? Oh, very. <laughs> I'm getting on, Nelly. That's the trouble. Oh, no, Miss Jarton, you're not. Why, you're in prime alive. No, no. A ruined man, that's Kirk Arton. Kirk Arton, the good old has been. Fine future behind him, they say, don't they? Oh, I know. Mm. Grand operas of pantomime. Pro provincial pantomime, too. Rotten place. Rotten theatre. Rotten costume. Oh, go on. It's a lovely costume, Miss Wright. It's all green and spangles, Miss Barrett told me. And hers is all white. Spangles, bits of broken glass all on the top of a wall. Keep cats off. Cotton types. Holes in them. Tails loose, too. Nice thing, a demon king with no tail. Rotten costume, rotten theatre, rotten play. Oh, right, Kirk, right, Kirk, but it's no use carrying on about it. A job's a job. Now, Kirk, lad, why don't you go back to the theatre and have a rest before we start again? <laughs> Chorus and ballet rehearsal at seven. Tom Burt's happy Yorkshire lasses and chapel choir. Hey, by gum, that it should come to this. Bye. I feel right sorry for him. Uh, I feel right sorry for us. Oh, come up, May. Curtain goes up on Boxing Night five days from now. And a murray, murray Christmas to one and all. Morning. He's not here yet, Mr. Burt. Not here, isn't he? What do you make time, Samson? 6.35. We go up at 7.15 and 40 minutes off Curtain with no Demon King. Very nice. Very funny. Hasn't anyone even set eyes on him? Well, I think Mr. Rudd... Oh, there is Mr. Rudd. Mr. Rudd, Mr. Burt was asking if you'd seen Mr. Ayrton earlier on. Aye, uh, I saw him. Going on two o'clock in the smoke room of Cooper's Arms. Uh, and he were furlapping it up. Anybody with him? Some chaps I've seen him with before. Leeds men, I should say. Near on five hours ago. We might be anywhere by now. Sleeping it off, most like. All right. Nothing for it but the understudy. What's he like, this local chap? Like nothing on earth, except a bow-legged baritone from a Wesleyan choir. Well, he'll have to manage. Get out there and drill him, and if he gets buried in dead cats and rotten eggs, Kirk Arton can look after his wife and children. All right now, Jonty. Uh, Got it? Uh, I think so, Mr Rudd, but uh, I'm that nervous. I hope I won't forget my lines. I'd better not. Costume fit you? Well, it's a bit big and the, the tights are in club on me, but I suppose I'm keeping him up. Good luck, Jonty. Well, you, oh, yeah, thank you, Miss Farron, and you. Well, we'll be seeing a lot of each other this evening, won't we? So we'll have to keep up each other's spirits. Oh, Good luck, Dulcie, my darling. Oh, oh, tar, Johnny. And believe me, I'm going to need it. Oh, dearie me. Right, everybody, one minute to curtain. Cabin scene all set. Yes, Mr. Rod. Albert, keep an eye on those flats. They look as if they might collapse. Now, Jonty, don't cheer up. I remember you're the monarch of the underworld, not a lost soul out of dance inferno. Uh, good luck, Alice, love. Best principal lad in business. Oh, thank you, Mr. Burt. Oh, I've got such awful stage fright. And now that miserable Ayrton's let us down, and I can't find my lucky pig. <laughs> Right, everybody. Good luck. Ready? Hey, by God, who's that? It's Ayrton. It must be. But, but he's sober. No, he looks splendid. He's got himself a new costume. Oh, isn't it lovely? All shimmery. New makeup, too. He's been to Leeds for it. That's where he's been. It's a theatrical costume, he is. Hey, but he looks enough to frighten birds. Never mind where he's been, so long as he's here. 
Uh, all right, John T, back to chorus. Oh, thank you, Mr. Burt. That'll do me champion. Right. All ready? Curtain! Mortals, beware. Approach with care our grot, or terrible indeed may be your lot. Beneath the magic well our cavern lies, where we may safely plot our villain eyes. We are so bad, we don't care what we do. Say what you like, we're wicked through and through. If you've a job to do that's dark and dirty, apply to us at once, we won't get shirty. If anyone anything lacks, if you'd melt every jungle in wax... Now watch you... poor author's copyright, if thou will, Bert. Yon's from The Sorcerer by Mr Gilbert. Yeah, why, so it is. Right then, I'll step aside and introduce our leader and our pride. Hail, hail, all hail! Hurrah, hurrah! Hurrah! He can a tale unfold, a forked one too. He's qualified to lead our fiendish revel, for he's, as you might say, the very devil! <laughs> all right, my lads, or as we say, all wrong, I'll start proceedings with a merry song. In the caverns deep of the ocean cold, the diver is seeking a treasure of gold. Leaving a world of sunlight and sound for a night like gloom and a silence profound and fearful the death of the diver must be dying alone dying alone dying I didn't do it, Mr. Rudd. I never touched it, did I, Herbert? That's right. Well, I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Uh, if you ask me, somebody let off a firework. Monkeying about, that's what it is. Well, let's hope they'll lay off it in Furry Queen's number. Oh, Lord, yes. Poor Dulcie. Oh, listen, she's on now. I am the Furry Queen, and here I stand to quell these wicked powers with my wand. I know your horrid plot, you evil thing, and I defy you, though the demon king. What? You defy me? Did you say defy? <laughs> I'd like to see you try. Yes, I. The fa... <laughs> <laughs> Good heavens, she's dried. Dried? She's really paralysed. Stood there with her mouth open like a fish. She's had a stroke. Aye, uh, all we needed. <laughs> You're in a fix, your fairy majesty. I point my finger and behold, you're free. Uh, oh, uh, yes. I, I, the elfin queen of fairyland, I do defy you and your horrid band. Oh, Mr. Arden, I'm that sorry. Then choose your weapons, madam, and we'll duel, not spell for spell. For that would be too cruel to pit your puny magic against mine. A dueling duet, then? Oh, yes. Uh, fine. Oh, Mr. Arden, I don't know what came over me just then. I couldn't 
Morva speak, thank you for covering for me. Correct, ma'am. I deserve your admiration, for I can deal with any situation. Oh, I'm sure you can. Funny, it was looking at your eyes made me go like that, I'm sure. <gasps> me cue. Um, the hands, hands, fill on the way. Be no more here. Mr. Ayrton. You wish you were? Then here's the very thing. Just look me in the eyes. Now, madam, sing. Go ahead. Stuff. Oh, Gal, I've heard everything now. Oh, Mr. Burt. Oh, Horace. Oh, Sammy. Marvellous, Dulcie, marvellous. <laughs> Go on, you two. Take a curtain. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayrton. You stop the show, you <laughs> and Dulcie Kirk. Now, if they'd only applaud like that all time. Oh, they take a lot of warming up in Bruddesford. A lot of warming up? Well, well, we'll see. For warming up's my speciality. Right in the park tonight, aren't you, Kirk? No need to strain yourself at it off stage, you know. All this rhyming and that. No strain, believe me. Quite the converse, quite. I'd go so far as call it <laughs> hell's delight. Well, if you say so, old man. You're on again, anyway. If you can warm up in this scene, he's a flaming marvel. He's just standing there, looking at them. What, what's he lifting his arms for? Pointing. Oh, search me. Never did it at rehearsals. And now, good people, since you've paid your money, last curse you laugh. This pantomime is funny. <laughs> Here's Jack and Jill approaching, pretty dears. Jack's in the front and Jill is in a rear. <laughs> While this enchanting female you see now is Jack's old mother with her faithful cow. And if you ask me which of them is which, the cow's the one that's wearing not a stitch. <laughs> Here's simple Simon. Brains are what he needs. I bet you ten to one he comes from Leeds. Me, hey, I don't know. Listen to him. All them old gags. Nay, no, dash it, they must be half seas over. We'll have to cut an hour out of the show at this rate. I don't understand it. I'm flummoxed, fair flummoxed. Jack's got a mother. She's a worthy dame. And Mrs. Martha Durden is her name. She loves her, Jack, although she knows he's lazy. But best of all, she loves her old cow, Daisy. <laughs> I'll never forget me honeymoon. Oh, we had a lovely afternoon for it. <laughs> oh, it, it was a lovely wedding too. A military wedding it was. My father was standing behind him with a shotgun. <laughs> we, we were coming away from the church, you know, and a man stopped his cab and said, Do you want a lift? No, thanks, I said. We've got a bungalow. <laughs> Oh, dear, 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 I'm probably glad to get off. Oh, they were lapping it up, Johnny, lapping it up. I've been playing games for 40 years, and I've never had a reception like that. It's frightening, that's what it is. And then Alice... It's ridiculous. I mean, the principal boy's not supposed to be funny. One feels such a fool, I mean. 
You're on again, Alice. Magic water scene. Oh, I wish I didn't have to. I don't fancy that Ireton at all. Go on, love. He can't hurt you. But it's his eyes. They make me feel all shivery. Well... The magic water found. Methinks I'll rest in this fair cavern. Yes, that will be best. And lest the place should seem a little eerie, I'll sing a song to keep my spirits cheery. Our country is our ship, dear sea, dear sea. A gallant vessel, too, of his future plough is he. Which man, what are his station, station be? When duty's call commands, he takes his stand. When duty's call commands, he takes his stand. <laughs> And now I'll rest indeed. Yet, what do I spy? Alton's not coming up through a trap. He's missed his cue. <laughs> he didn't use the trap. He came from nowhere. Either Kirk's drunk or I am. Yes, tremble, silly mortal, for it is I. And now I'd have you know you're in me clutches. <laughs> the place for such as you, lad, is in hutches. I'll have your bones for bread, your blood for tea. I'll use your skin to cover a city. I'll kill you, grill you, cut you up and fry you. I'll slay you, flay you, tan your hide and dry you. I'll grind you up and bake a cottage loaf. I'll finish you, in fact, your silly oaf, until the gossips wonder as they clack if ever there was such a thing as Jack. Oh, oh, oh please. Please don't. She's forgotten her lines, daft lass. She's frightened stiff. Hey, look at her, green under all yon paint. You know he's carrying her off. What'll he do to the ballet? We'll soon see. <laughs> Come on, Yorkshire lasses, dance for all your worth. Oh, yes, Mr. Bird. Isn't it exciting, Elf? Oh, my, my dress. Yeah, I'm worried about this ballet, Mr. Bird. It's never gone well. I have a feeling it will now. Watch. And now, my friends, as we've a breathing space, I think a dance would not be out of place. Behold, behold, I summon thus my minions. <laughs> And they approach, each on his bat-like pinions. <laughs> now, all you hags, you hellhounds, hear your king. I'll show you how a demon ought to sing. <laughs> While the wolf in nightly prowl, Face the moon with hideous eyes. While the wolf in nightly prowl, face the moon with hideous howl. While the wolf in nightly prowl, They've been carried out. They like fainting to myself. A ballet now? A little hellish dance? Come forth, you miserable imps, and prance! Pasta! 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 I want a bob's worth of brandy. Quick, send the lad out for it. Did you see them? Dozens of them, all red and black and green, dancing like fiends. Uh, oh, six little girls. Oh, no, I'm going mad. Oh, that clapping, it's marvellous, but I can't hear myself think. Go on, Dulcie. There's a good lass. Why, Jack, what's this? A captive, drear and sad? I know what's happened. You've gone to the bed. But fear not, I am here, and so is Jill, to free you from this ghastly nor the mill. I wave my wand and see the spell is all. Rise, Jack, a free and happy boy once more. 
Fairy Queen. Dear Jill, I thank you greatly, for I've been in a dreadful state just lately. Mother rejoice, I found the fairy gold, and now our dear old cow need not be sold. <laughs> Ah, oh, Jack, me gallant son, me only joy. Whatever God need doing, Jack's the boy. Jack's the boy for work. Jack's the boy for play. Jack's the lad for the girls to sing. They kiss the tears away. Ah, oh, oh, the tears are flowing. Jack's the friends are shown. Jack the boy, Jack's the boy. They all our hearts are torn. Well, that's over. Praise be. Oh, I wish I'd arrange for a bouquet, Mr. Hyatt, and after a show like that. <laughs> You'd like a flower, a tribute at your feet? <laughs> Dear lady, that can be arranged too sweet. Oh, 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 oh Mr. Hyatt, my father's hundreds of bouquets. Flowers, look everywhere. Roses, daffodils. Shh, Mr. Hyatt's got something to say. Uh, shh, shh. Dear friends and colleagues, pray accept these flowers in tribute to our two last happy hours. You think it is not my nature to be gay, but even I must take a holiday. Besides, it's Christmas. At this time of peace, I'm happy to declare an armistice. If by my tricks I frightened all you ladies, remember ere you wish me back in Hades, that thanks to me and all my art contrives, you've given the best performance of your lives. Farewell! And when men speak of me to you, remember, please, to give the devil his due! <laughs> Look, Dorothy, the flowers. They're all fading, curling up and going brown. They turn to dust, withered away. Me only bouquet. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Burt. Yes, Harry. Uh, a message come through for you to stay's daughter. Well? Uh, from Leeds Infirmary. It says, Mr. Arton was knocked down in Ball Lane via cab this afternoon. Uh, they're keeping him in tonight, but he shall be all right for tomorrow. Thank you, Harry. I'll see him in the morning. When I go over to Leeds to sign the pledge. Adam? Then, then, who's that? Up there on stage, taking call. Nay, lad. He's <laughs> gone. Vanished away in smoke. Smoke? It's brimstone fumes. My heck, I'll sign pledge tonight. <laughs> That was The Demon King by J.B. Priestley, adapted for radio by Michael and Molly Hartwick. The Demon King was played by Ian Wallace and Dulcie Farrer by Marjorie Westbury. Production for the BBC was by Charles Lefoe. He presents June Tobin and Stephen Murray in a play by Philip Mackey, The Right Person. Jorgen? Jorgen, are you in the... Oh, not back yet. Hello, Porter? Yeah? Oh, hello. This is Mrs. Jorgensen. Can you tell me if my husband came back to the hotel this afternoon? Which is your room number, please? Room 308. You know the English Mrs. Jorgensen. It's such a common name in Copenhagen, isn't it? I said it's such a common name in Copenhagen. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, has my husband been back? I've not seen him. Oh, it's just that we arranged to meet here, and I'm a bit late myself. But it's not important. It doesn't matter. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Manga tak. Hello, Jorgen. Oh, this is the hotel porter again. Oh, sorry. I thought it must be my husband. There's a Mr. Rasmussen. Rasmussen? I don't think I know him. Will you speak to him, please? Yes. Rasmussen? Oh, hello. I don't think we've met. Uh, no. 
If it's my husband you want, I'm afraid he's out at the moment. But are you quite sure you've got the right person? It is Jorgen Jorgensen. Yes, but, I mean, there are millions of Jorgensons and thousands of Jorgen Jorgensons. You're sure you haven't made a mistake? I do not think so. Well, if you can wait, he'll be back any moment now. I should prefer to see him privately, if possible. Well, I expect we'll be having a drink up here in the room, if you'd care to join us. He'll be here almost at once. You'll permit me to come to your room now? Yes, of course, if you'd like to. Thank you. I should like to. It's room 308, on the right, as you come out of the lift. Thank you. Oh, better tidy the room a bit. These parcels. Just pop them in the wardrobe for the time being. Now, drinks. Ach, Babit. And some glasses. That's right. Wonder who we can be, this Mr. Rasmussen. Hope Jorgen won't be long. Coming. Mr. Rasmussen? Yes. Oh, do come in. Thank you. How well you speak English, but then everybody here seems to. I suppose you all learn it at school. Yes, we do. So you know my husband? I think so. From the old days? That's right. But I'm not quite sure if he's... Um... The right person? Yes. I wish to be sure. <laughs> of course. Won't you take your coat off? If you do not mind, I should like to keep it on. <laughs> Just as you like. Can I give you a drink? No, thank you. Akvavit, it's your national drink. You're very kind, but uh, no, thank you. Oh, well, do sit down. Thank you. Do you mind if I have a drink? I've had rather a heavy afternoon rushing around the shops. Oh, please. How did you know Jorgen was here? It was uh, simply an accident. I arrived at the hotel this morning. I do not live in Copenhagen now. I only come here on business. And when I signed the book, I saw the name, Jorgen Jorgensen. Skoll. Skoll. So I asked who was this Mr. Jorgensen, and they said it was a gentleman, about 40, who had come from England. Oh, that fits in with your person, does it? I mean, your man went to England. I'm not sure. I think perhaps he did. Jorgen's a British citizen now. Is that so? Mm, he's really completely anglicised. He's even talked about changing his name to John Johnson, but I wouldn't let him. I'd much rather be a Jorgensen. So you were a friend of his in the old days? No. No? We were not friends. I never knew him at all well. We were comrades at one time. Comrade means the same thing as friend. I think not exactly. Well, in English, comrade is a word which... I do not want to mystify you. It is that we were in the resistance together during the German occupation. Oh, I see. We were in the same group. But in, in that sort of underground work, you do not know the other people very much. I saw him a few times, that was all. Oh, yes. Just enough to be able to recognize him again when I see him. Yes, Jorgen told me he'd been in the resistance. What did he tell you? Only that he'd been in the resistance. Here? In Copenhagen? He didn't say... And I didn't ask him. I thought probably he didn't want to talk about it. You're a very understanding wife. I hope so. I try to be. You've not been married very long. What makes you say that? You, you have the look of a young bride. <laughs> I suppose it does show. So I might as well admit it. I've been married exactly one week. Is this is your honeymoon trip. Yes. I'd always wanted to see Denmark because it was here Jorgen came from. And he hadn't been back for years and years. Not since the war, I think. Oh, and he had some business to do here, so it all fitted in. And, of course, he would want to see his old friends and comrades. I thought so, but he doesn't seem to be having much success. His parents died some time ago, and he says that nearly all the people he used to know have moved away or gone abroad or something. Also, I suppose some of them are dead. Yes, I suppose so. We haven't really met anyone at all yet. Except me. Except you. But then you said you weren't, weren't a friend of his. No, not a friend. Then why do you want to meet him? I mean, is it just that you'd like to see him again after all these years, or is there some special reason? I want very much to see if I recognize him as the man that I knew. And will he recognize you? I think so. I've changed a great deal in the last years. Perhaps he has too. But I remember his face, and I expect he will remember mine. What happens when you recognize each other? I mean, do you and your old resistance group have reunion dinners like ex-service people do in England? 
where you all get wonderfully drunk and talk about the good old days and what fun it was in a way <laughs> and how it's never really been the same since. There are such reunions, but not for my group. You don't enjoy that kind of thing? I should enjoy it very much, if it were possible. Then why not try and arrange something? I'm trying now. Oh, I see. And of course you want to invite Jorgen as well as the others. Mrs. Jorgensen, your husband and I will be a complete reunion in ourselves. Were there only two of you in the group? No. There were twelve of us. And you can't get hold of the other ten, or some of them anyway? The other ten are dead. All of them? Yes. Oh, what a shame. I'm sorry. Doesn't that sound an inadequate thing to say, but I am sorry. They died during the occupation. All at the same time? And all in the same place. And all in the same way. Shot? Yes. You and Jorgen were the only ones who escaped? Yes. He's never said a word to me about this. I did not suppose he would wish to talk about it. Oh, excuse me, one should... If it is your husband, please do not tell him that I'm here. Why not? Please do not tell him that I'm here. But good heavens, why on earth not? Uh, hello? Jorgen here. Oh, hello, darling. Where have you been all this time? Oh, it dragged on for hours. I'll tell you about it later. Are you coming back now? Yes, as fast as I can. Good. I'll wait here for you in the room, and we've got... Why did you cut me off? I asked you please not to mention that I was here. Give me that telephone. Please, sit down. I want to know why you did that. Mrs. Jorgensen, sit down. I'm sorry I have to behave like this. Then why are you doing it? Mrs. Jorgensen, your husband will probably ring again in a moment's time. If he does so, when you answer the telephone, please do not mention that I'm here. Or that anyone is here. Or that anyone is here with you. What difference does it make whether I tell him or not? He's going to meet you in a few minutes I anyway. ask you. I shall do as I please. No. Look. A gun. But why? You may answer it. But remember. Hello? It's me again. Oh. We got cut off. Yes. You were in the middle of saying something. Was I? No, I, I, I don't think there was anything else. Ah. Oh, all right, darling. See you soon. See you soon. Oh, Jorgen. Mrs. Jorgensen. What? Nothing. It doesn't matter. Bye, darling. Bye, darling. Thank you. Who are you? What are you? What kind of game is this? Probably there was no need for me to have taken that precaution. If you had said to him, oh, Mr. Rasmussen is here to see you, I don't think it would have meant anything at all to him. In the resistance, you see, we all had different names. We never used our real names. I called myself Robbie. Jorgen Jorgensen was Toralf. Who am I? What am I? In those days, I was Robbie, the leader of a little band of saboteurs, experts at throwing high explosive bombs and at strangling men from behind. Now I am Hans Rasmussen, a very respectable businessman who owns a factory at Odense and comes to Copenhagen once a week on business. I'm a member of the town council of Odense. Next year, I shall be mayor. If you had said Mr. Rasmussen from Odense, he would have laughed and said, who on earth is that? But you see, I wanted to be very careful. I did not want anything to happen that might make him suspicious, that might stop him from coming here. What would have happened if I'd said, Robbie of the Resistance is here? I'm sorry if I have to answer such a question. What would have happened? He would have turned and run to the other end of the earth. Why? Why? To save himself from being killed. Why? He was your comrade. He was in your group. He was the only other one who escaped. You mean... Was it... We were 12 men in the group. 11 were captured by the Gestapo. 10 were shot. I was the man who was captured but not shot. And you're... Con I was pulled out of my bed in the middle of the night and taken to the shell house. It was the Gestapo headquarters then. 
There I was thrown into a room with ten other people. My people. My group. And Jorgen? They looked at me and I looked at them. One by one, naming them to myself and counting them. Then I said, Toralf is not here. And they knew what that meant. Perhaps he'd escaped. They hadn't managed to catch him. Only we twelve knew who the twelve us were. So if the whole group but one were taken, that could only mean that the traitor was that one. Perhaps he was captured too. They kept him separate for some reason or other. The only reason could be that he was giving them information. Why otherwise? We were all together there. How did you manage to survive? I was the leader. I was the one who knew about the people higher up. They kept me alive so that they could persevere with their efforts to make me talk. And then one day your air force came here and bombed the shell house so skillfully that we, the prisoners on the top floors, were not hurt. Some of us were able to jump out of the windows and make our escape. And you think it was Jorgen who betrayed you? I'm sure this was done by the man we called Toraf. I found out afterwards, after the war, that Toraf's real name was Jorgen Jorgensen. <sighs> Why am I getting excited and head up and scared to death by all this? You know better than I do. There are dozens of people called Jorgen Jorgensen. It's like being an Englishman called John Smith. Because it happens to be my husband's name, as well as the name of the, the person who betrayed you. You can't jump to the conclusion that my husband is that person. I do not jump to conclusions. Oh, this tall of course, you remember what he looked like. I shall recognize his face. Well, it's quite clear to me. It's simply that you've got hold of the wrong man. Let us sit patiently and wait. Very soon we shall know for certain, one way or the other. Excuse me if I have another drink. You're bad for my nerves. I'm sorry. Are you sure you won't? Quite sure, thank you. I thought the Danes were fond of that with it. It is simply as I would rather not drink with you when it is possible that... It shall kill my husband. Yes. Well, I know you're not going to. Because I know it's not him. So, Skoll. Skoll. This man, this Torolf. Suppose the Gestapo caught him and tortured him. Suppose they forced him to tell who his comrades were. It may have happened. Oh, can't you understand that? Yes. But I cannot forgive it. Was he a man who might have broken down? It's difficult to say. But I thought him a man without much feeling, a hard and callous man. Why should he have betrayed you unless he was forced to by some unendurable... There's one possible reason. Toralf was the treasurer of our group. We had collected a lot of money secretly in banknotes. We needed it for a big plan we had for buying things and bribing people. At the moment of our arrest, Toralf was holding all the money, about a hundred thousand kroner. Hundred thousand. This is roughly five thousand pounds. I don't believe a man could do such a thing for the sake of five thousand pounds. In history, it has been done for less than that. But this is only perhaps. I do not know what happened. Perhaps he escaped with the money. Perhaps the Gestapo took it from him. Perhaps he hid it somewhere so that he could come back later and find it. Nothing but perhaps, perhaps. Nothing but theories and possibilities. You don't know anything for certain. This is right. There's only one thing certain, absolutely certain. All this has got nothing to do with my husband. Oh, don't you see? It couldn't possibly be him. I shall be very glad if it is not him. For your sake. When Jorgen comes, and you see he's not the man you want. I shall finish my business in Copenhagen. Tomorrow I shall return to my family. And everything will be as before. Let's wait for him to come in, then. We'll all have a drink together and five minutes of polite conversation about how Denmark is doing these days. You're so certain. Well, of course I am. I know him. I know it couldn't be him. You know the person you love, the man you get married Not to. Not always. Not completely. I know, Jorgen. Then we can wait with confidence. And look at it reasonably. If it were Jorgen, why should he run the risk of coming back here without even changing his name? It's such a common name. There would still be the risk of meeting you. He would think that I died with the other ten men. Or of meeting someone else. By now, everyone else has forgotten. Why take any risks at all? I don't know. Perhaps he came back to find the money. 
Do you think my husband is Tolf? Perhaps. Oh, but it's impossible. Jorgen, my Jorgen, he's a very brave man, very gallant. Doralf was brave. But he gave you away to the Germans. Jorgen couldn't have done that. When he got to England, he joined up in the Air Force. He went on bombing raids. This is quite possible. But his whole history is the history of a different kind of person. How much of it do you really know? Oh, I tell you, I know him. I know all about For him. For how long? How long have you known him? Well, only a year, but... Only a year. But I've been told so many things, not just by him, by people who knew him, people who served with him. They all admired him. Everyone did. He got a medal for saving one of his crew when their plane crashed, even though he himself was very bad. Why do you stop? You're going to say something. What was it? He was badly wounded in... in the arms and legs. He still walks with a limp. Is that what you are going to say? Oh, go away, go away. Forget you ever came here. Forget the whole thing. Go away now. Where should I go? Are you less certain? It's not him. It can't be him. I, I know, I know it can't. Then why do you ask me to go? It's for your own sake, don't you see? If you wait for my husband to come, you'll know immediately he's not the right person. But that's no good. It doesn't make any difference to your intention. My intention is evil. Don't you know it is? Yes. But I cannot help it. It's a kind of poison inside you. Perhaps. You're a man with a family, a home, a normal sort of life. Don't you want to go on like that? Yes. I do want to. Then give up your revenge while you still have the chance of your own accord. Not just because you didn't find the man you wanted to kill. You say this because you are afraid. No. You're afraid it might be your husband after all. No. I should go now. For my own sake. Yes. I think you are right. Go. Please go. But for your sake, I should stay. What do you mean? Could you bear to be married to a man for the rest of your life, knowing that perhaps, perhaps, he was a traitor and a murderer? I know he wasn't, I know. Are you so sure of this that no doubt can ever come into your mind? Now, or five years from now, or ten years from now? Are you so completely, perfectly sure? No, I'm not. And the poison would be in you. The poison of doubt, which would kill you. You cannot go on with your life unless you know the truth. Shall I go? He would tell me. Innocent or guilty, he would tell you the same thing. And you would not know whether to believe him. But if you kill him? Is he the man, then? I don't know. Shall I go? You want to go on not knowing? If you say so, I shall go. I... You want me to stay or go? I, I don't know. Mother, it's me. I would have asked you to stay. Hello, darling. I forgot to pick up the key at the desk, but I knew you'd be here. Sorry I have kept you waiting so long. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had visitors. Um, Jorgen, this is Mr. Rasmussen from Odense. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen, my husband. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? I should explain why I've come here. Uh, did we know one another in the old days? Uh, you must forgive me so long since I've been in Denmark. I've forgotten a great number of names and faces. You do not know me. Oh, I'm afraid not. I had a comrade in the resistance who was called Jorgen Jorgensen. I'd wondered if perhaps you were him. I don't think so. I, I was in the resistance, of course. Here? In Copenhagen? Uh, no, in Helsinger. You are there all the time? Oh, yes, until I escaped to Sweden and then to England. Did your man go to England? Perhaps. I don't know. He simply disappeared. 
But in any case, it's not of great importance. The important thing is, you are not the man I had been hoping to find. Oh, thank I'm God. I'm sorry, I apologise. It must be a great disappointment to you to come here and find the wrong person. Uh, no, I assure you, it is not a disappointment at all. Still, if you were looking for a man... I'm perfectly happy not to have found him. And now that I've failed to find him, I will thank you and say goodbye. Oh, don't go so quickly. Have a drink. Or has Martha given you one already? No, I... Uh, I only came here one minute before you arrived. You see, I didn't even have time to take off my coat. Do please take it off now. No, no, I must go. And you have uh, things to do. At least you'll have a quick drink with us. Uh, very willingly. It's a long time since you were in Denmark? Oh, yes, I escaped quite early in the war. Uh, How does it feel to come back again? It feels wonderful. Here you are, darling. Thank you. Mr. Rasmus. Thank you. I drink to my own homecoming. Skull. 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 Now, if you'll excuse me, I shall not intrude no longer. I, I thank you for the drink and for your kindness in receiving me. Mrs. Jorgensen, now as I know your husband is not the man I was looking for, I say goodbye to you. Goodbye, Mr. Rasmussen. Goodbye, Mr. Jorgensen. Oh, goodbye. I thank you both very much. Please do not trouble to come down. Goodbye. Oh, nice chap. Yes. He'd only just arrived a few moments before I did. Yes, I was sitting here having a drink all by myself, waiting for my faithless husband to come home. Oh, darling. Oh, I suppose I had to be away so long. But uh, did you have a good time with your shopping? Oh, yes, I, I bought all kinds of things. I'll show you them in a minute. Silver salad spoon, fork and ashtrays in that lovely blue china. And some books. Are you and, sure uh, you didn't overdo it? You, you look tired. No, no, I'm all right. You've got dark circles under your eyes. It was rather a hectic afternoon. Oh, poor darling. What do you feel like doing? Shall we have dinner up here and go to bed early? No, let's go out somewhere. I'll be all right in a minute. I'd like to go out. I want to celebrate. Oh, fine. I'll show you some more of Copenhagen. It's a lovely evening. We'll have dinner in the Tivoli Gardens. Uh, what particularly are you celebrating? Just that I... I got married to the right person. Ah, it was me who did that. Jorgen. What, darling? Jorgen, I've always wanted to ask you... Go ahead. When you crashed in your aircraft... Mm, yeah. Were you very badly burnt in the face? <laughs> Why do you ask that? Oh, it's just that I don't want to think you were ever any different from what you are now. You'll make me very conceited. No, no, I wasn't burnt, only a very little hardly at all. The scars have pretty well disappeared now. I'm so glad the war didn't spoil your beauty. And now let's go out somewhere for that celebration. I must clean myself up a bit first. We won't go to Tivoli, we'll go somewhere more expensive, somewhere very expensive. I'll think of a good place. Why are you throwing your money about? You should have asked me what I was doing this afternoon. Business? Lawyers? It was the estate of my uncle who died. It's all settled now. And believe it or not, your husband is now rated by 100,000 kroner. 100,000? That's quite a lot of money, roughly 5,000 pounds. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, God. Now that we're rich, we can stay here longer if you like, or we can go somewhere else. What would you like to do? Somewhere else. What did you say, darling? Somewhere else. Somewhere else? Where shall we go, then? Where shall we go? Anywhere in the world, as far as I'm concerned, as long as we're together. That was The Right Person by Philip Mackey with Stephen Murray as Rasmussen, and June Tobin and Anthony Vickers as Martha and Jorgen Jorgensen. From London, we present Geraldine McEwen in Trials of Fidelity by Miklos Jafas, translated from the Hungarian by Laszlo Andras. Trials of Fidelity. Zoom. Zoom. The plane took off an hour ago. 
John will touch down in Stockholm in 30 minutes precisely. Another architect's conference. Isn't he lucky? <laughs> oh well, I've no cause to complain. I suppose. I'm alone in the flat, face down on the couch. I'm alone. Alone in my hometown, Budapest. Alone. I can do whatever I like. Hmm. Strange, it never occurs to me that he might have an accident or something during the journey. With John, disasters are completely out of character. His plane's certain to be on time. It always is. Ever since I've known him, he's done everything he wanted to do. He's always maddeningly successful. <laughs> he's even made a success out of me. I married him 18 years ago. And during all those 18 years, I've been faithful. I don't know another woman, not a single one, who would have been faithful to her husband the way I have. But if there has been one, I'm sure she must have cracked up in the effort. I just can't stop patting myself on the back. Faithful for 18 years. Amazing. Not that there haven't been men. There have been plenty oh. who wanted to lead me off from my journey. Oh, yes. Plenty. Hey there. Help. Keep quiet, will you? Uh, Swallowed much? Yes. It's all right now. Just hold on to my shoulders. I'll soon have you out. One. Two. There. I'm standing up. Put your arms around my neck. Oh. That's it. I'll carry you out. Oh, here we are. Terra firma. Oh. Now, let's get out of these shadows and into the sun. Put me down, please. Oh, I have no intention of putting you down. If I got you out of the Danube, I have a right to hold you in my arms. Please. Why? Because I'm married, that's why. Oh, never. Put me down. And which school is your husband in? Which form? Hmm? He's an architect. He's in charge of the reconstruction work here in St. Andre. I came down for a swim, I got cramp in the leg, and now will you please put me down? Are you really a grown-up? Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I thought you were just a student. I said I was married. Oh, and in that case, I'll put you down. Thank you. Lucky you were passing here when I began to go under. Wasn't it? But now you'd better go home and change. You're soaking wet. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm okay. Then, thank you again. And goodbye. Uh, your husband's an architect, did you say? Uh, how old is he? 32. And you? 18. 18? Yes. If you're really 18, then I'll introduce myself, just as I am, covered in weeds. What? You say your name, too, just as you are, in shoes and gown. I beg your pardon? Oh, come off it. Just say, thanks, Francis, for saving my life. Oh. I turned my back on him, left him high and dry, ran up the bank, and never looked back till I reached our house. But all the way home, I could hear his voice saying, I'll introduce myself, just as I am, covered in weeds. Saying, Just say, thanks, Francis, for saving my life. But I said nothing. He did save my life, of course. <sighs> Nothing much really happened. The poor boy fell in love with me as he was trying to save my life. 
Can't blame him, I suppose. Although perhaps I shouldn't think up excuses for him. Anyway, I had every reason to hurry back to John, who'd been my husband for six months. My sure and healthy instincts led me back. Yes, my fidelity was running like a well-oiled bicycle, and I pedalled away on it back to my husband. Of course, it wasn't always as simple as that. The second fidelity of my life was a much nearer thing than the first. I was 24. John had gone to some congress, as usual, I can't remember where. Anyway, I was alone at home again, feeling terribly depressed. And suddenly, this restlessness came over me, so I decided to go out. I found myself at the zoo. Why in the zoo of all places? Why in the zoo? If you'll pardon me, I can tell you. Your childhood memories have brought you here. These words were spoken by a man wearing a check coat. I glanced at him in amazement. How could he read my thoughts? <laughs> as you put the question rather loudly, it wasn't difficult. He smiled as he said this. And later on, in front of the lion's den, he said... Look how afraid and sly that lion looks. I wonder who it was who first said that the lion was brave, who invented the notion of courage at all. Why? Do you think there are no courageous beings? The world's held together by cowards. Are you a coward? Of course. How do you know? Well, I never do what I'd like to do. If I had the slightest courage, I'd tell you all about myself and end up by confessing my love for you right here. But I can't even pluck up enough courage because well, I'm an even worse coward than the lion. I looked at the stranger in the check coat. He was certainly better looking than my John. For one thing, he was taller. And his profile was stronger. Also, his voice was more pleasant. I mean, John would have said... But I can't plug up enough courage, because I'm an even worse cow than the lion. Mm, yes, that's how John would have said it. But the man said it like this. But I can't even pluck up enough courage because I'm an even worse coward than the lion. Could two things be more different? But does it make any difference if one is faithful to one's husband? As a matter of fact, I don't think the man meant his love. Because if someone as manly as he was, and having such a voice... I'm an even worse coward than the lion. Well, what I mean is, if he really meant he was in love, He'd certainly have tried to kiss me. What am I talking about? As if I'd let him. Never. There's no better feeling for a woman than to keep her fidelity. It's like taking a shower on a sultry day. One just stands under one's fidelity and lets its cooling, bracing shower run down one's body. Mm. What problems a faithful woman has. The easy women have an easy time. They simply deceive their husbands and that's the end of it. But here we are, the poor faithful who get no sympathy or understanding from anyone. That's the bitter truth. No one takes any interest in the faithful woman. Neither the women's guild, the trade unions or the government. We're never on the agenda. We work away at our fidelity while the others have their fun in the limelight. <gasps> the telephone! Maybe they've taken notice of me after all. Perhaps the President of the Republic wants to convey his best wishes on the occasion of the 18th anniversary of my relentless fidelity. Hello? 18th Women's Hairdressing Shop? No. This is not the 18th women's hairdressing shop. Wrong number. Damn. Now I can't think of what my next fidelity was at the moment. No wonder, really. There have been so many. The first was the lifesaver. The second, the man in the zoo. The third... Ah, yes. The third... Oh, Santa, oh, Santa. <laughs>
The third one I met in the Matthias Church. It was a Saturday afternoon in January. My husband was taking me for a drive in the castle district. The music and the whole gay winter atmosphere cast their spell over me, and I went inside the church. John remained outside in the square because he noticed some architectural fault about the reconstruction work that was going on on the church. Up in the choir, the singers and the soloists were rehearsing a bark mass for the following Sunday. I was standing by a pillar, looking at the peeling walls and the ragged church banners, when suddenly I became conscious of a man's voice beside me. Anne. I turned towards the voice in surprise. Anne, don't you recognize me? Sorry, but I don't. I looked up at the tall, masculine figure. We played tennis in the same club ten years ago. I was an undergraduate. I'm a doctor now, gynecologist. Stephen Mollick. Of course I remember you now. But you wore a moustache in those days, didn't you? <laughs> I stopped growing it. But if you're interested to hear more about me, let's go outside, and while we're taking a stroll, we can talk. Impossible. My husband is waiting for me outside. Pity. Pity. I said, too, out of politeness, and added, I must, I must go, go now. now. It, it was, was nice to see you again. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm sorry you have to go. It's my day off, and it would have been nice to have a chat with a woman after so many women. Cheerio. You know, I'm a lonely person, but since we met, I... Goodbye. Aren't you glad we met by any chance? Yes, but... If only you understood what it means to me. Please, let go of my hand. Forgive me. Goodbye, then. And my regards to your husband. And I'll be waiting for you at this pillar the same time tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> I hurried out of the church, put my arm through John's, and forgot the whole affair with Stephen Marlick. Did I say forgot? When we sat in the car and John said... You were ages. I almost froze stiff waiting outside the church. I thought that's the kind of man John is. Somehow he always manages to express himself so meanly. And I thought something else too. But if Stephen were my husband, he certainly would have been much kinder to me. Like this. Anne, how well everything suits you. Until now, I've only noticed how well your new hat and little boots become. Now I realise the church becomes you too. But that is not all. When the same night John put his arms round my waist at the window and said... Look, it seems as if the whole street is coloured with icing sugar. Really? Icing sugar. What an ordinary imagination John has. Stephen would certainly have expressed himself more poetically. Look, it seems as if the whole street was thronging with white gulls. No, he can do better than that. Look, it's as if the whole street had been carved of glittering white marble by a lonely sculptor. That's better. And I went on comparing the two men. John pulled me close and began to kiss me. Oh, darling. Your lips, he whispered, are... Like red cherries. Such clichés, I thought to myself. I could already hear Stephen's voice. Your lips are like the summer with the sun's warmth on them. At that moment, I pulled myself up. The simile was easily better than John's, no denying it. But I told myself firmly that I couldn't carry on thinking like this. Fidelity is not a thing to play with. Fidelity is fidelity, which leaves no room for compromise. Once you've set out on the path of fidelity, there's no halfway house. In my imagination, I indicated the door to Stephen Marlick. Go, Stephen. I said in a tone that left him no leeway. And he took himself off. There are women who dream all their lives about deception. Of course, they're not naturally faithful. And if they don't cheat their husbands, it's out of sheer despair. They are the ones who nag. Of course, 
These faithful saints are all the more debauched in their dreams. If I were like that, I'd detest myself. But I'm faithful to my husband in my dreams, too. Though Julius Caesar once wanted to possess me. He came, he saw, but conquer could he not. Oh, it was a terrific dream. He began his siege, the man who had conquered the whole world, and I was the last thing left to conquer. He was speaking hot words under his breath in an excellent translation from the original Latin. I was drumming with all my might on his brawny body, and with the greatest possible strength of mind, I said, Let go, let go, Caesar. You have a wife. Be sensible, please, I said. I grew quite familiar with him in my dreams. Please let me alone. I won't cheat my husband. I won't. I was shouting all this in Latin. This shows what a woman is capable of if she is faithful. Caesar never lost a battle, he cried, and lifted me up in his arms. I kicked, I clawed, I bit, but he didn't bat an eyelid. He just smiled and said, never a battle so important, never victory so sweet. He held me in his arms like two steel clasps. He bent over me and wanted to kiss my lips. Then he cried out even more passionately than before and said, speak. Which country shall I conquer for you? Which dominion shall I make you queen of so that you may be mine? I didn't answer. I kept silent and proud. What woman has ever had such a price offered her? And what woman could resist? I, for one, resisted stoutly. My fidelity proved a match for the man who had the whole world groveling at his feet. But I had dreams of other celebrated men, too. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Yes, I had a dream of Shakespeare, no less. He wanted the same thing as Caesar. When I told him that I was faithful to my husband, he made an innocent face, and without further ado, launched into a monologue. There's no fidelity greater and truer than thine, Anne, and I shall ever regard thee as faithful even though it be but a mask, even if thou shouldst once prove frail. He spoke in this fashion for a while. Then, warming to the task, embraced me. I resisted once again. Immortality counts nothing with me. So I started drumming on his body like I did on Caesar's. He was astonished I had no respect for his being a classic. He thought I'd be his mistress out of pure love for literature. He was mistaken. I chose John between John and Shakespeare. I know this is a bit hard to understand. Even John found it so. I know because when I told him about my dream next morning, he said... You're a marvellous woman, Anne. But to be quite frank, you baffle me. I suppose it's no new thing to you if I say that I could never think of any other woman but you. Still, if Cleopatra should offer herself to me in a dream, well, I, I don't know if I could resist the temptation. I was very disappointed, if only because I had previously resisted Caesar. This was the first time that I felt John didn't understand me. It hurt me what he said about Cleopatra. It was so vulgar. All the same, I continued to love John just as I had done before. And I never had second thoughts about William Shakespeare. For me, fidelity is the only modern way of life. Hello? Uh, hello, 18th Woman's Hairdressing Shop? No, this is not the hairdressing shop. Lasted. What? Oh, I do beg your pardon, but... Can you imagine that whenever I ring up the 18th Women's Hairdressing Shop, 
It's either busy or when it isn't, I'm put through to all sorts of private flats. This is a private flat, and it's the second time you've dialed the wrong number. You see, I'm trying to call my wife. Oh. Uh, she's a hairdresser and works at the 18th hairdressing shop. I see. Uh, she's one of the best workers in the trade and has been twice decorated for good work. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're so proud of her. Of course I'm proud of her. She's the most lovable creature in the world. Oh, oh and so beautiful. Pity I can't show you a photograph of her on the phone. How long have you been married? Ten years. Oh. And we've been in love for ten years. But I really must apologize for disturbing you. Not at all. Let me congratulate you on a happy marriage. Thank you. You see, I'm happily married, too. Isn't that marvelous? Yes. Two happy people meeting by accident on a telephone line. Two people who know the secret of happiness. Well, I don't know if we understand the same thing by the secret of happiness. If I told you my secret, you'd laugh. I think I'm quite unique. The secret of my happiness is... Uh, please don't laugh that I'm faithful to my wife. I'm not laughing. No? No. And if we're now talking to each other as two strangers, I can tell you in return that my secret is just the same. Incredible. Marvellous. What a fantastic coincidence. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. I've been married ten years. Oh. Uh, by the way, I'm 30. Uh, how long have you been married? Me? Yes. Uh, five years. Well, that's a nice long time, too. Yes. Five years of fidelity. Yes. Well, that's something, especially when a woman's so young. <laughs> you, uh, you don't sound more than 25. 29? Marvelous. <laughs> well, may I wish you every happiness for the future. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, it's just occurred to me, my wife works till nine. Oh. Now, I'm going down to the Fountain Coffee Bar. Yes. If you like the idea, drop in for half an hour. You could carry on this conversation there. But You'll I... recognize me by the fact that I'll be reading Hemingway. Can you come down? No. I... I don't know. Well, if you don't come, let me once more wish you the best of luck in everything. Goodbye, then, or better still, I'll be seeing you. Goodbye. Till then. What a nice, enthusiastic man. And he thinks just like me. How odd. A strange man asks me for a date. Two faithful persons sit down for a chat in a coffee bar. Why shouldn't I go? Besides, I'm curious to see the man face to face. The man who's got the same mind as me. Has the same way of thinking as me. I'll go. Yes! longing for the moment when I can face him. How much more exciting it is for a woman to stay faithful. Adultery is so boring. I'll introduce myself, just as I am, covered in weeds. I tell you all about myself, and end up confessing my love. I'll be waiting for you at this pillar, the same time tomorrow afternoon. Never a battle so important. Never a victory so go. Mustn't back out. At least I'll be able to look danger in the face. For you, John. See, I'm not afraid of temptation in your absence. Yes, my dear, you can rest assured. At this moment, when you're stepping out of the plane at Stockholm Airport, your wife, who knows that the single meaning of her life is that she is faithful to you, goes off to a date. Thank you that I can again be faithful to you, John, my darling. Thank you that I can again taste the water of the spring of fidelity. Oh, thank you. That was Geraldine McEwen in Trials of Fidelity 
by Miklos Jafas. It was translated from the Hungarian by Laszlo András. This radio adaptation by Jerry Jones was produced by John Tideman.